This episode is made possible by New Masters Academy, the world's absolute number one online art school in the galaxy. Click the link down below for a free seven day trial. Thank you, New Masters Academy. I am in your mind. I am in your. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Honey and Absinthe After Hours podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Vincent, a background designer for the Hollywood animation industry. And I'm Janet, the ex Disney artist turned independent creator. And this is a podcast about all things art, business, and whatever we feel like. Today, today we're going to talk about quitting your job to become an independent artist, featuring our buddy, Chris Cacayo. <sighs> <laughs> um, Chris is a good buddy of ours. We've known him for many, many years. Fantastic artist and uh, crazy, crazy convention person who went on conventions with us every single time we did conventions. We would see, we would see you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was my, uh, it was my pretty much my life for a while. But uh, I'm glad you guys had me on today. Yeah, man. Yeah. I've been away from conventions for a while since, you know, the, the coof the happened. Co- so uh, it's, it's going to be fun to kind of talk about it. And um, I haven't seen you guys in so long. It'll be nice to catch up with you guys a little bit. Yeah, this yeah. whole episode is us basically catching up live, <laughs> well, in front of you guys. So um, first of all, you're looking fantastic. We hope you're doing great on this Monday morning. Uh, you're going to do fantastic because you're here with us. Right? You guys are going to have a great Monday, a great week because you're listening to this podcast. But first, let's talk about how we met Chris. <laughs> because, so like, before, before everything, before I got hired in animation, before Vincent got hired in animation, um, we did conventions. And we kind of sucked at it <laughs> at first. And that's kind of when we met you. When we were like budding artists, basically straight out of art school we basically graduated and then we uh were having a hard time finding work so we were like damn we need to do something with our (laughs) lives so we were like oh this conventioning thing is really like lots some of our friends actually showed at conventions and we're like oh we're from art school how possible how hard could it possibly be yeah we we, like all us art school people have like a chip on our shoulders because we're like oh how hard could it be like (laughs) we're trying so hard to get a job in the industry and we're like what's selling prints what's yeah what's selling prints (laughs) and then we met chris at Anime California, way yeah. back when. 2015. Was that 15? Yeah, that was 15. Yeah. Uh, either, I can't remember if it was the beginning of 15 or 16, or it was a while ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we were tabled next to each other, kind of in the back of the room, which, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is rough. Like, you don't know it at the time, but being placed in the back of the room is like a nail in the coffin. Like, you're just not going to do well. Yeah. Did you guys do okay at that show? No. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I definitely didn't, yeah. so I just... <laughs> Well, how long have you been doing conventions since, since that time? Because it was our very first one. That was like my third convention. Oh, dang. Oh, wow. So we were barely, barely trying to figure things out. Yeah, like yeah. none of us knew what we were doing. Oh, you know? yeah. um, up until things got canceled uh, February 2020, I've done 151 conventions. Wow. wow. <laughs> Get on Chris's <laughs> level, everyone. Seriously. Damn. And that's that's without sending a crew out. That one's just me. Yeah, yeah one I man. Don't, I don't have a crew. Like I have people that come. I hire my friends to come with me. And by hire, I mean I offer to buy them drinks and, <laughs> and McDonald's and stuff. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. We. So that con we were doing miserable (laughs) and i remember i think you and the girls next to us were also like you guys actually were doing better than us so we thought we thought we were like we suck (laughs) we were like why do we but then like looking back with more like con experience all of us sucked we we were like all not having a good time but trying to make the most of it did you let it affect kind of like your uh, your self confidence, or did you like it? L- let it get into your head and be like, "Well, oh, my artwork didn't do well at this show. Maybe my art isn't that good." Oh, that no. happened to you guys? Not at all. Okay, good. That we, happens to people sometimes. Yeah. Just, so we wanted to. Oh man, this this reminded me of something. I wanted to talk about, especially with you, like those moments when, like, let's say you're doing really good, but then like there are like other people who aren't doing so good, and they're just like staring you down. <laughs> Have you ever oh, yeah. had those like oh, yeah. moments? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that can work for any any job, right? But yeah. like specifically at the cons, it's kind of like, oh, 
that's that's not my problem like honestly like you you have empathy because everyone's done bad at some point mm-hmm. and you have a little empathy for them but ultimately you're just like i'm too focused on myself like if you would stop looking at me and start looking at your table you'd probably do better next time for real yeah we've for definitely real. like because we were in that position with you guys and i mean we've both of us all of us we've had such bad experience like really bad con experiences but also really good ones so when we're doing well we're not we're not like oh yeah i'm hot shit <laughs> and like i'm so much better than you it's it's just we got lucky this one weekend yeah but the, you know uh i hear it a lot with some people where um you know all in hindsight now like mm-hmm. if your sales do bad you're like oh my artwork isn't good you know it's just all this the self-doubt and like you 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 connect too much emotionally with the business of it so it's like people think because their artwork is selling really well they think that they're really good artists or the opposite you know when in reality it's all just kind of random nonsense because like you could have adam hughes placed in the back of a room and he's probably not going to do well Mm -hmm. because nobody knows he's there you Mm -hmm. know so it's just like that's the whole thing about cons though you know and again, we, that's what we didn't know yeah. when we were in the back when we first met. Just we were doomed right from the beginning. Right. Yeah. We had no chance. But it's like no that chance. learning yeah. and like that like kind of like feeling at stuff that like at least got me uh, really addicted to the con life. And you yeah. actually weren't so sure about it. It is addictive. Yeah. yeah, it is addictive. Yeah. I think um, I wasn't sure about it because I I don't know I I didn't get it at first. But then when you asked like did it let it affect like the failure affect us i think it lit a fire in her ass. Okay. We, were, we were like no we need to we need to figure this out uh-huh. they're like failure is unacceptable we need to like li- like clearly there are some people who made sales and who, were, who did fine um but i do remember um sitting there there was like an artist literally across the hall from us like facing us and she looked like a very experienced con artist because she had um she had keychains and all these all the the stuff that you don't develop until you're like much more experienced right. doing conventions but the way she, they lay things out yeah mm-hmm. she looked so she looked like we we <laughs> we had like those grid things that like we don't <laughs> use anymore because they're a cumbersome to, yeah. to set up they make those out of plastic now what yeah you can get them really well oh. anyway <laughs> <laughs> technology's yeah. gone up since we were like, <laughs> oh my we've been um, doing this for so long yeah um but she, she was so dejected i remember thinking like no like i remember it was our first time selling commissions and i think that's what like um it was one of the break- breakthroughs yeah we were like wondering like oh it's hard to make a print it's hard to make like a keychain and all this stuff but we do know how to draw on the fly and then like we know you do that too and, it, and we we found that it was like a huge draw at a convention uh, and we found that out i think at the convention after uh anime california which was sabacon i think mm-hmm. oh i was there with you guys yeah, that yeah. yeah i think in so. vegas sabacon in vegas yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh i find at comic book conventions you get a lot more artists um who are doing commissions but at anime conventions I don't know if it's just the skill level's a little lower across the board at an anime con because the artists are, you know, let's just call it what it is. People who start off doing anime don't like to really study the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. I find that mm-hmm. artists who like the Western style comics will go more into like learning anatomy because they got to draw their superheroes the way that, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. there's an expectation. Yeah, sure. yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think the, the, and what you're saying is true about the commissions is because there's so few there's fewer people at anime cons doing on-spot commissions that's a fact so that's mm-hmm. that's real like what you think you discover there's actually real yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah we we realized very quickly because like we even amongst um people we graduated with a lot of people can't do that mm-hmm. um it, like people working in, in the industry they're, they're too afraid that. to even like yeah. draw at a cafe yeah. you know that type of thing but it does take a lot of um just trying to like being okay with like drawing around people and just being okay with yourself i think mm-hmm. to be able to do that it, get that nervous jitter yeah, get oh, yeah. It you can't do that yeah <laughs> no like we we love going to like drawing workshops and that kind of thing so like it became like what can we get people's attention how, how do we get people's attention oh i know let's like draw for them and um, yeah, most people can't. But we noticed 
from our next convention at Savicon that we kept seeing you. <laughs> we didn't think we'd see, like, we'd get like regular faces we see all the time. Yeah. And you were like at every convention that we went every to. Every single one. <laughs> even, even at WonderCon when I wasn't selling, I went as an attendee. I still, <laughs> yeah, I still <laughs> bumped into you. Yeah, I remember. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how did you get into conventions? Um, so I started drawing near the end of 2012. And um, I think it was either 2013 or 14 when there was a local convention and there was an artist who was selling his work there and my friend wanted to introduce me to him, but that guy was like a major d to me. Um, so I just asked, I was like, why, why are you introducing me to this guy? And he just told me he's, he sells his artwork and he travels and he makes a ton of money. He's like, he told me, he's like, I think you could draw better than him. And I'm like, yeah, I can. <laughs> so I just, I took what his, his, business model was and I just reverse engineered it and then I just did that because I didn't have anything else to do with my life so I just did that and then as that developed I started vlogging and then I made the YouTube channel which kind of carried like everything that I'm doing now um, that's built my fan base so the conventions was like the catalyst for everything but I, I started it just because I wanted to draw and I wanted to sell artwork, but I didn't know what else to do. So I, I copied this business model of somebody who clearly knew what they were doing, and I made it work for me. Mm. So what were you doing at the time? I was doing uh, Yu-Gi-Oh commissions. So like oh. the play mats, you know, the big mouse pads that people play cards on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I was taking uh, a bunch of personal commissions for that. They were mm. <laughs> I wasn't able to charge a lot because one, my artwork wasn't that good, but two, there's there are a lot of other players in that that field and like mm -hmm. i could only get so much work and then um yeah i was just like i want to make more money and if i can travel too then why not so that's where yeah. it came from so yeah. like when you would get like these personal commissions for the the play mats this was like all like pre-youtube pre-conventions pre-everything mm -hmm. wow yeah, so, so i was doing that for like almost a year and oh, then i man. went to that convention no it was I can't remember the dates. I can't remember the timeline of it. But after I saw him at uh, at that local convention, I went to Anime Expo with my friends. That was the first anime, like big anime convention I'd ever been to, like a real one. Because the other one was at like a shopping mall. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I went around with like a notebook and I was walking around at all the tables and I was writing down how much people were selling things for. And I was I was making little sketches of people's tables. And like I said, I noticed um, Yume uh -huh. was there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with her, mm -hmm. but like her... Her line, even back in 2013, is bigger than any line I've ever had, <laughs> even to this day. So, yeah, so I was just, that's where I, I, again, I just took notes from what I saw was working. And then I tried to work backwards from it and incorporate it into what I was doing. So I was already, I already had all those notes down and I was testing things out, like right when we met. I already had all that stuff mm. written down in the book, yeah. That's so smart. We didn't even think to do that. So if you're, if you are thinking of doing <laughs> conventions, that's one, because we actually started doing that towards like the tail end of doing conventions. We started like, because we want to go to the convention before we um, table. We want to be exhibitors. I mean, not exhibitors, um, just attendees, attendees. Yeah. just to be able to scope out like, okay, what, what's the culture here? Like, is, is it anime? Is it um, independent? Is it comics? And how much are people selling their uh, prints for, their shirts for, and all, and yeah, all their products yeah. for? And like, that's just stuff like I wish I knew. Yeah. When I first started, for and, sure. Yeah, and then when I started flying for conventions, there was there's the other the other thing where it's like minimum wage is it the same everywhere? Mm. Mm. So sometimes you have to charge ten dollars for a print if you're in like middle America versus like you go to New York, you can charge like thirty dollars for a print. Mm. If you're in California, about twenty bucks, you know, easy. Mm -hmm. So it's I mean all that stuff. I, I had a conventions over in Europe. That was a hot mess. I could not figure out <laughs> like when I first went. There, I could not versus, figure. It. Yeah, yeah. Europe was like wait a minute, just because one thing is $20 here, I can't do 20 euro there, you know, because that's so much. Mm -hmm. and yeah, th there's all those little factors that go into it. So it's good that you guys are doing your, your research. Were, oh, was that around like 20, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, when you guys were starting to yeah. plan to... Yeah, when we really like uh, wanted to t like build this like independent business thing, we really took, yeah, we went out and uh, we had a great advice of like... Um, taking note of uh the people who are buying things and how many bags leave the convention center mm -hmm. and like just all that all those types of hacks we started to do yeah it's it's kind of the exact same strategy as like 
retail sales mm. like that's what apparently back in the day when you would pick your location on like the street like um i want the corner office space in this one street people in order to like figure out like if that's a good spot they'd like have like a stopwatch or those like timer things yeah. and they would like count how many people would like pass by and that's apparently someone i heard someone else do this for conning like they would literally stand at the doorway of a con and with that um stopwatch thing and like count how many people had bags in their hands of like they went to this con to buy stuff and they that's how i guess in a more technical way they <laughs> they rationalized if this con was worth exhibiting it or yeah. or not um that's more or less what my youtube videos are hmm. except instead of clicking i invested money and time and <laughs> put in all the work, <laughs> all the work. yeah <laughs> yeah for, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the the youtube channel that i have um i ran a, a youtube series it's 83 episodes as of right now um where it's it's basically from one of my very first cons like i think first episode came out late late 2014 and it just follows me throughout all my conventions i talk about flight and and all the crazy bad things that have happened or all the good things that have happened mm. the interesting people i've met i have some really nice conversations like genuine conversations with people on there um i talk about if if it, if the con is well run mm -hmm. uh, you know like what's what's selling how yeah. much hotels around the area are they trying to screw you over with parking <laughs> yeah. so i mean like it, it's it's really interesting when i even i go back and rewatch it sometimes but a lot of i feel like there's a lot of solid information in there in regards to like which cons are worth and which ones aren't mm -hmm. oh yeah like i remember watching uh your stuff on youtube when we were still you know doing conventions and stuff and going mm -hmm. like not only is he doing these commissions and stuff he's making this youtube stuff and uh you were documenting your entire experience not just at the con like on the road and just like the entire lifestyle that you lived which was like super inspiring to us who like worked in an office yeah. you know it ignited our wanderlust oh, yeah. and we really wanted to like do what you yeah so like a lot of what we do is actually like really inspired by what you oh, wow. have started yeah, yeah for sure we were like like i felt like at the time we were like weekend warriors yeah because <laughs> one we never actually figured out how to travel for cons mm -hmm. like with the whole flight thing and making it work expense wise because it's expensive to fly yeah. and all that stuff you have to um, really make sure that the show is worth it yeah to fly. and that's why we never like bit the bullet because we were like uh, we we are not making that much yet and like the risk is too high because we, we we both <laughs> have had some uh scams <laughs> horror stories where people have like run away with our money oh my god <laughs> oh this the one we have a mutual horror story yeah <laughs> we'll get, definitely oh get into okay. that for sure <laughs> <laughs> um, so around when, so like what made you go all in? Because like you were the first person that I met that did cons pretty much every weekend. And we were like, how, <laughs> why, how'd you know to do that? Um, yeah, the, the more time I spent on the road, I actually found like a handful of people who were doing it every weekend, mm -hmm. but honestly still not that many mm -hmm. for as many shows as I went to. I, I only really found like less than fewer than 10 people who were doing it at that level but i i was doing that because like i've done a lot of things in my life you know i started drawing when i was 25 and so i've tried a lot of things in my life and i failed at like all of them and i was just like when i started seeing a little bit of success i was like well this is different i can make this work mm -hmm. so i was just like well i have to do everything to make this work otherwise it's just going to end up like all the other things mm. so it was a uh, I guess a level of uh, necessity, but also lack of other options, and I just didn't want to fail again. I was just like, I'm not getting any younger. Like I can't. Yeah. So, so I guess necessity is uh, why I did it. Because I'm like, if I have to make this work, otherwise I go back to my old job, and that's no good. Mm. Yeah. Around what time? Uh, like what year did you really start taking conventions seriously? Uh, 2016. Oh really? Yeah. I was. I did one or two in 2014. A local one. Um, in, in Fresno, California, and then I went to um, one in San Mateo, which was really trash too. <laughs> and then like nothing for a while, and then at the end of 2015 was, I think um, Ace Anime California was the third one. Mm. So 
and then after that was like Sabacon, which was there. So like end of 2015 was when I started going nonstop. And then during 2015, I had signed up for like like 30 in 2016. So I kind of had to just wait for those ones. And then it was just a nonstop roller coaster from there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's why a lot of people don't realize. Like your first few cons kind of suck because you have no... <laughs> you didn't sign up you have to sign up like a year in advance mm-hmm. for everything and the ones that you can get into like that year are almost guaranteed to kind of suck yeah because they're usually small if there's not like a year wait between when you sign up to when mm-hmm. the show is usually it's smaller yeah yeah but like it's crazy you have to you have to fight people to get accepted then you have to pay like a year ahead of time and then you're invested a whole year ahead of time yeah. and then you have to get your fly if you fly or a hotel and it's just like a it's just so much to manage mm-hmm. on the, the gamble yeah. that you're gonna make money at that the show might make <laughs> low money. key the gamble is what makes it really exciting you know what i mean it's like addictive. it's yeah. really it's addictive. super addictive yeah. Yeah. yeah like that um it I, I guess you could call it like a dopamine hit when mm-hmm. you're you're at the table and you're talking to someone mm-hmm. and then you're able to kind of like ruse them into buying a print and you're just like gotcha <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, no, it's, it's super. Yeah, exactly. It's that feeling, and like someone like really just like vibing with your work, and yeah, it's it's that's why we do cons. It's like definitely a different experience from what we do professionally, and it's something we miss a lot. Yeah. For sure. So when I was around the time when I started going all in on conventions around that 2016 time, was that when you started working? Yeah. So it's funny that like you had your. I guess, epiphany to start doing conventions in 2016, because that's kind of when I got hired. Mm -hmm. And there was about a year and a half between when I graduated art school and when I started working. And in that in-between time, I actually... I I wasn't actually super stoked to work in the industry, because I had worked a full-time job before um, interning and doing other things creatively that I was like, I'm not entirely sure a nine to five <laughs> is for me. Um, because I like, I think five or six months into my internship, I already felt like I was dying. <laughs> like I love the work, but there's something about it that I was like, maybe I'd be better as like a freelancer or something else. And then when you graduate reality hits and like, it's not easy <laughs> to work as a creative and all that stuff. So I was freelancing at the time, um, here and there. Sometimes successful, sometimes not. Um, and then it's technically how Honey and Absinthe and all this started. Um, we just didn't call it that at the time. I worked under my own name, Vincent worked under his name. Um, and we did conventions on a whim. Because, I like, like you said, we had nothing better to do. Um, in between waiting for freelance and all that stuff, uh, we had to make art, and we wanted to make money, and we, were, we thought, Artist Alley, why not? And Vincent, you actually did conventions before I did. Yeah, I did Anime Expo with a, a friend of mine, uh, Eugene, Duke of Flies. Follow his art. Um, but it was that was the first taste of, like... Um, Prior to that, I've been at art school. I've worked some small freelance things, and then I'm, I've, I was very used to that. But this was the first time where people were walking up, like looking at this print that I made or like this the sketch that I did, going like, "I really like that. Can I own that?" And that was like the wildest thing because it reminded me of when uh, I was a kid and like when I started drawing, and people were like, "I really love that. Can you draw my favorite cartoon character?" And it just harkened back to that. And then uh, I had that experience at anime expo 2014 and then um we got together and then i was like you know we should try going to anime expo and it was kind of like pulling teeth trying to convince (laughs) you or persuade you to do conventions so long you hired yeah (laughs) why should i sell friends but but then i kept telling like there's something different about this convention (laughs) thing and then i did it and then like the challenge yeah is super addicting there's something i don't know maybe we're like masochists or something yeah crazy (laughs) so so did anime expo leave a, like a bad taste in your mouth because I know you haven't done it in a while or you had no like when was the last time you guys did AX because you did it and you said 2014 that's 2014 and then yeah. we applied I think because the only reason Vincent got in was because of 
my friend, yeah. okay. like his partner basically <laughs> didn't come. But like, um, uh, we did, you did split a table. We split a table okay. basically. So um, the next few times we did Anime Expo, uh, we did have to go through the rigmarole of signing up. And like the first two times were great. Yeah. Like I, I think we had such a great time. It's the only reason why it, it fell off. It fell off for us was because of how astronomically big the convention was becoming. Yeah. 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 It was. It became. Like there, there's so much drama around oh. Anime Expo. <laughs> um, Line con, yeah, and all of that, and just, I, it feels like the convention sometimes is not run by people who value people, <laughs> artists, other humans. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a big, it's a big corporate thing yeah. now. I mean, like you could totally feel it. Yeah, like mm. it's. It's just what it is, you know. That's what it became because there's so much money involved, and it's like San Diego Comic Con, mm-hmm. where it's not really about comics. Yeah. The anime Expo. I mean, you could argue it's still about anime, but it's about money. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. So. Yeah. So we, I mean, we stopped for. Uh, we were getting so into like comic art and like our art being known for that that it just didn't fit. Like we felt like we had to make two separate mm-hmm. sets of prints. One for anime shows and one for comic shows. Mm. That was a bit really big reason. But also, like, one one time someone fainted because they didn't want to like turn on the AC in the artist alley uh, and stuff like that. I know what like you're that. talking about. Yeah. That's uh, 2016. That's when my <laughs> that was my first time tabling in the artist alley at oh. AX. Yeah, down because that was when they first originally they had the um, the artist alley and the exhibitors area in the same mm-hmm. floor upstairs. That was the first year they moved the artist alley downstairs mm. into like that really hot parking garage (laughs) area and yeah i just i don't think they were ready for it and i I think there were multiple instances where people were just passing out because it was so hot (laughs) i think they finally that's not an exaggeration like it was like paramedics came in (laughs) yeah Yeah. um yeah i think another reason too was just uh uh the we noticed the comic book conventions just had more people willing to shell out money paid more definitely yeah. for sure it was an older crowd older yeah. crowd older but like crowd. T- we talked about this because we had breakfast before the show um that like it seems as though uh things are changing and that yeah. the young kids are like super they're just super into anime and now they're like getting older and now they're they might be become or they they will become the people buying the prints and mm-hmm. all of that yeah because yeah. you know the the people who grew up with the the more western comics uh, are adults now with kids and they're mm-hmm. going and they're buying things they couldn't afford when they were younger the same way how you know we'll go buy like a a, a, a 2006 Nissan 350Z because it was too expensive <laughs> back in the day but now it's like oh that's not that bad so like um, the kids especially these days they grew up with access to anime like with Toonami and mm-hmm. you know now Crunchyroll and just mm-hmm. like a decade or less than a decade they're going to be adults and they're going to be buying all kinds of crap that they couldn't when they were younger. Oh, yeah. So I, I wonder if like, if something uh, like Anime Expo could ultimately either rival or like get bigger than San Diego Comic Con just because, I mean, these weebs, they'll, they'll spend <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. they're intense. <laughs> I don't know. They're, they're fanatics, They man. are intense. They're yeah. crazier than the comic book people. Yes. But like, I love them, yeah. but like they are, they, when they love their character, they will like do they anything. It. Yeah. To, like shrines. to commission you. Yeah. 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 Being trapped at home for a year. Right. Like, I have friends who all they do is read manga. That's like all they do now. Like they'll work from home, kind of watch anime in the background, and then when they're done, just read manga while they have anime. In the <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh my god, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but <laughs> yeah, at the, so at the time, uh, right when we met, when you were taking um, conventions really seriously every single weekend, like we followed each other on Instagram, and I, and 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 then I followed like your YouTube channel, um, and we were like, how it. That seems like the life. You get to travel. You get to like just uh, like make art on your own like time. Meanwhile, I literally was about to do the same exact thing you were doing, and then I got hired. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like. But you can't turn that down if you get hired, though. That's what it is. You just that that is still an opportunity. You can't be like, nah, nah, nah. nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like at the time, I I really was like. I this is what this is this was my dream like I I went to school for this obviously I'm going to take this job um but I was so angry I I was really like mad that like I'm doing all this work like making portfolio piece after portfolio piece getting no attention in fact having to test a lot which is 
just free work for the studios, like an entire week of free work. Meanwhile, I can just go over like on the weekends, go to like a con, make like three thousand dollars, and be like have really genuine conversations and your interactions with real people who enjoy what I do, trying to meet me because they saw my Instagram or something like that. And I was like. And you get to vlog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I can I can do whatever I wanted, and then once I got hired, once we both got hired, I would watch your vlogs and be like, I made a huge mistake. <laughs> like we would be watching yeah. your vlogs while we're like f***ing sitting there doing <laughs> like, working miserable. on cartoons. Oh, and you guys like, saw the early episodes yeah. though. I really upped the production on it later. Oh, yeah. dude, we were just so impressed by the whole idea. The hustle, the, the yeah. idea for me was like just the whole idea of like the of just taking us along with you mm -hmm. uh, to to wherever far away convention you were doing. So, what was your life like during that time? Like, go, like go, traveling constantly and going from con to con. It was really fast. It was really aggressive. Um, I was dealing with a lot of like mental issues during the time which made things not so great mm. uh you know it, it was really hard because i was balancing like a new relationship uh i was in uh i didn't get to see my family a lot like the stuff i didn't talk about in the vlogs mm. yeah um and then the it made it harder because the the continual pressure of i didn't want to fail mm -hmm. and that's pretty much a drew like so publicly it, it put too. it put everything it put everything to the side like mm. like family and friends i didn't see my friends for like two whole years while i was doing it mm. and i was only sleeping like like i was averaging honestly like three hours a night oh, like <laughs> like if i slept for like eight hours one day i would feel so guilty i would have like a tremendous amount of guilt and i would stay up the entire night the next day Man. yeah so um and and the kinds of pieces that I was selling at conventions, have you seen the big collage pieces that mm -hmm. I do? Yeah. So I would do those like once I realized that because for a while, I had half fan art, half uh, original concept art because mm -hmm. I wanted to still kind of do my own thing. But after a few years, I realized that you can't have it split. So I went all fan art, and then eventually, by the time the cons started going away, or by the time the cons got shut down, I was actually only selling five different prints. Mm -hmm. just collages and that made me more money than when I had a whole stack of stuff that's crazy yeah. 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 so it was like a strategy thing but anyway um, during that time like the beginning parts um, it was rough you know I didn't see anyone I didn't do anything fun nothing fun mm -hmm. uh, I actually had a very uh, interesting night uh, in Las Vegas that kind of changed my entire view on like everything mm -hmm. I like I think back on I wasn't even I was like such a robot like I was Mr. Hustle Hustle. Like, I watched too many YouTube videos. <laughs> but I mean, it got me to where I was, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, right. But I had zero quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I was doing Evo in, in Las Vegas. Uh, and my friend tagged along with me. I hadn't taken any days off in, like, I think, like five months. And he said, We're going to go. We're going to go out. We're going to go clubbing tonight. <laughs> and we got super fed up on. Nice. Uh, all kinds of drugs <laughs> and it it like opened up something in my brain and then I kind of sat there for a few days and I just kind of reorganized my thoughts of what was important mm. and uh, that's when I started toning down on the conventions uh, yeah what, what what epiphanies have you come to if you could never recall them like if after I could your recall drunk them? adult yeah. <laughs> yeah what is it like like is it like, like your 4 a.m <laughs> your just life like 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 no, you're gonna it, die someday was, or? well yeah that too but, <laughs> yeah. that too but it was also just like what's the point like what's the point of doing all this work for these cons mm. when it's just like ultimately uh that's when i realized i was i was just kind of on autopilot i'd been doing so many cons for so long i was only doing it because it's just what I do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't even enjoy it anymore. I'm tired of traveling. It made me kind of just like realize that I had like emotions and I was just like, oh, I'm I am tired of traveling. Like I'm fucking just, mm -hmm. I'm done with this. I'm, I only want to do cons that make me a lot of money because it, if it pulls me away from like, even if I wasn't in a relationship or I didn't have friends, it was still taking time away from drawing. And mm -hmm. I was just like, so it's hurting my personal life and it's hurting my long-term goal, which is to be a good artist. Mm -hmm because now I'm just a traveling salesman. Mm -hmm. So I mean like you know like it, it it's all it it looks great 
yeah. you know, the way I, I put it up. And I, I feel like I'm pretty honest about how the how rough some of it is. Oh, yeah, you're very real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I think I think the best the best situation, which I think you guys could pull off, is I have some friends who they travel with their families. Like, mm-hmm. um, I have a friend who sells uh, all chibi artwork, mm-hmm. but it, it, he travels with his wife. Mm-hmm. And they have a great time all the time. And I'm like, that's a totally different thing than what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So if you guys are able to pull that off, that's different. You will not have the same like crappy result as me. Yeah, that's that's the whole cycle of it. And then once once I realized uh, my priorities was you know to kind of enjoy myself a little bit more, but focus on the long term, which is getting my art better, which cons were taking time away from. That's when I started kind of reorganizing where to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I was stuck in a, uh, I was stuck in the cycle of the conventions because you know you signed up for a con, you have to wait a year before you can, right. you know, and then like they don't always refund you, so it's mm-hmm. just like this. Okay, well I'll just do a couple more. I'll just do a couple more. And it's like oh I can't stop because then they have all my money and that's where all my money's coming from. So when you get stuck in that convention cycle, it's hard to get out because your money is invested already, and then it takes up so much time. It's hard to build things on the side. So whenever I have new people come into my stream and ask me, I'm like, build something on the side first and then use cons for quick money and to prop up that other thing. Don't make cons your full-time gig like I did. Yeah, that's a conclusion you and I ultimately found uh, just doing doing this a lot that like uh, I think conventions are a great um, source to like supplement something else Mm -hmm. like if if you were able to do like a comic or something you actually get to see the people and i think seeing the people so much more powerful than like you know any online interaction you can have Mm -hmm. there's just something different about it and i think i mean i'm sure you have people who like come back like reoccurring people who like come back and buy your stuff or say hello at the table at the table yeah yeah Yeah. anytime i because you know i've been doing it for a few years so you go to the same show every Mm -hmm. year for some reason, you'll recognize somebody. It, it doesn't make any sense. You interacted with them for like five minutes yeah. a whole year ago, but you recognize them. They recognize you. I don't know how that works. And I can't. I can barely remember. Like I can't remember anything. Well, I can remember people at cons. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, but yeah, you you, you connect with them on a personal level. Yeah. yeah. We at the time when we realized that because I, f- I feel like we probably realized that a little bit sooner than you because w- I remember thinking like, man, Chris is like a robot <laughs> doesn't sleep just keeps going and then we were like um very um not judging your art but like wanting you to grow and we were like you know chris has grown a lot but he's at this point now where like he needs to like take some time for himself to 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 draw to just like do art and improve and all that stuff and like he could like go so far and like we were really happy to see that you eventually did that because we were like we see we saw that conventions were taking a toll on you like yeah yeah we could tell that you had no time to to even make new work and like it was like you would literally not sleep to make new work and i was like that's not healthy (laughs) yeah um it was 2019, which was the last like big hurrah piece that I did um, so far. It was a it was a drawing of every Dragon Ball character. Have you seen that one? I think so. Yeah, yeah, it was uh the way I did it was I went through every episode because I I've seen a lot of Dragon Ball drawings with like a lot of characters, but I said mine's gonna have every character. <laughs> so I um I I went through every episode: original Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball GT, Dragon Ball Super, and then all the like I I literally sat through all of them. And every time a new character came up, I'd like pause it, and then I'd like screenshot it, and then I'd write some stuff down, and I did that for every character. It took me like three weeks to get through everything, and that's all I did during the weekdays. And I did cons on, I did the conventions on the weekends, and then like when I was off the con, I was doing it on my laptop. And then it spent over a thousand drawing hours just straight. Like I wasn't even, I wasn't even giving my uh, now wife girlfriend back then any attention like at all. Mm. No, I wouldn't even walk the. I wasn't doing shit. Mm. like it was terrible. And um, I like I went to a Kauai con while I was working on the Dragon Ball piece in Hawaii. My friend came with me. He wanted to go out and explore the island. I didn't see anything. I was just like, no, I just went to the room. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's that kind of shit where mm-hmm. you're just like thinking back. You're like, is this how I want to remember my not just my life, but like my art career? 
mm-hmm. you know even if you don't care about having a fun time with your life which i do but like say you don't is this how you want to remember your career you mm-hmm. know it's just like yeah so yeah, it, yeah it's just like th- there is a you have to find that yeah. it was it worth you know mm-hmm. was, we we realize that because like you said once you're like signed up for the next year you kind of have to just do it even if you're you're trying to make some changes in your life we i think we signed up for like i want to say like eight conventions previous to getting hired so then yeah. we were like oh shit, i'm hired i have to also do my full-time job and also do these conventions and most people most industry people the ones who do do conventions they take days off like they they will take either friday or monday off to either prepare for or recover from the convention i didn't do that we didn't do that nope (laughs) (laughs) so it got to a point where we were really burnt out because on top of doing that like outside of uh work i'd come home uh do like make new prints and then um we go to the conventions on the weekend and i never really took vacation i never really like did anything for ourselves for like good like year you were making prints at dreamworks yeah where i had no time (laughs) no time yeah Uh, it's hardcore (laughs) when i I had no work (laughs) i don't spend my free time everyone else is like looking at youtube cat videos cat like yeah (laughs) looking at facebook whatever i'm like drawing comics doing like prints and stuff and at a certain point we got really burnt out and that's when i think i think we told you um when we saw each other at a convention i forget which one that we're like we're cutting back on the conventions we're gonna do like only the biggest ones because they're the only ones truly worth it yeah. at, at a certain point for, um, for, for all all reasons whether it's you want to interact with people or you want exposure or you just want that quick cash it's really only the big ones that are really worth it anyway Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it really does though take it takes all those small ones to prepare you for the big ones. And then once you're like experienced enough, you can finally make that decision of being like um I'm I've grown. <laughs> I've grown past the smaller conventions and I just simply don't have time. I have yeah. better things to do yeah. with, with my life. I am still listening to Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And it is a fantastic motivational book. You should really listen to it. And if you don't have it already, head over to audibletrial.com slash the Honey and Absinthe podcast to get one free audiobook or two free Audible original audiobooks. I highly recommend Can't Hurt Me. I really do. And that's audibletrial.com slash the Honey and Absinthe podcast. After a while, it gets to that point where you're just like, like, my time is worth so much more than like this small show mm-hmm. and you're just like honestly i would rather do nothing and that's more valuable to me than doing this stupid small show yeah <laughs> yeah uh, i mean did you is that is that how you were feeling when you were working at disney or you're just like this was cool but like i value my time i'd rather literally just do anything else is that what it was or yeah um i always have like bigger dreams than what what most people have i guess um i never saw conventions as like i want to make money at a convention i saw it as like i'm learning a business skill (laughs) like i'm learning how to sell my art to people and once i learned that i was like what else can i sell like i've always wanted to make apparel I'll put my art on on t-shirts and stuff like that. I all and that like same thing with Disney. Like I never went to animation thinking I wanted to work in the industry because I didn't. I I wanted to learn the skills necessary to either run a company or run a show. And at a certain point I realized that's not what I'm learning here. I'm learning how to be a grunt. I'm I'm learning I'm learning how to use my risk better or something i don't know i've never worked industry but every single person i've met whether they're at a convention or or at dinner or even those who have moved to twitch mm-hmm. all say the same thing the same <laughs> shit you just said <laughs> they will never say time. it publicly they, they will never, never say, say it publicly, publicly. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, let, since we're on this topic, why, I mean, I can't really talk about this because I'm still in it, but why don't you two talk about sort of like um, the careers you had and then why you want, why you two both wanted to switch to this more kind of high risk 
creative lifestyle. <laughs> so yeah, that's so, the only way to live. Yeah, man, man. <laughs> man, yeah, maybe we only live once. Um, I actually want to know more about your story because we don't know too much about it. Um, you used to be a mechanic, and you didn't actually yeah. start drawing till twenty five. Yeah, I went to. Um, Oh boy! Among all the things I did, I I did go to uh, Universal Technical Institute, UTI, uh, in Sacramento for automotive, and then I, I specialized in emissions repairs. And then I worked at a Toyota dealership. And then I just I worked. I didn't want to work there anymore, which was a mistake. Um, that's basically like the industry to the. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so I I started working in emissions repairs, so like smog stations. Um, and I was just doing that for a while and. I remember just getting up at like, like my whole life was, I'd get up at like four and I'd go to the gym because I had nothing else to do with my life. Then I'd go to work, and then when I got off work, I had the choice of either going to play Yu-Gi-Oh, which was usually the choice, or <laughs> going back to the gym, or like going out on a date to go like hook up or something. Like mm. that was that was like my whole life for years, and then I just, uh, I I came across and this is gonna be like super super savvy but it's totally true. I came across. Uh, have you seen uh, Dead Poet Society? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Carpe Diem scene. Yeah. I remember like I got home from the gym and I was getting ready to go to work in the morning and you know it was all manual labor so I'm always all beat up. My hands were all black and um, super shredded though. But <laughs> I, I saw that scene on YouTube just randomly just popped up in my feed. And I just sat there and I just like started crying. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing, dude? And I was like, I can't do this forever. So like the next two weeks, it was so difficult to like wake up and just go to work. Mm. It was complete, like my mind had completely changed. And I was just like, okay, I don't know what to do, but I know I don't want to be here anymore. So I actually told my boss, I gave him my two week notice after that. And he didn't want me to stick around for two weeks. And I was like, fine, whatever, I'm out of here. <laughs> Um, yeah, but the, the difference is like when, when, uh, when I'm on stream and people ask me for advice about switching over full time, a lot of them are art students. Like they just mm -hmm. came out of school mm -hmm. and they have a lot of debt and they don't have money saved up. And I tell them I can't help you. And they get mad when I say that. But the truth is, you know, I had, I had kind of my, my shit together financially when I got started because I had this other job and I didn't do shit with my money. I was, I was pretty just boring. Right. So when I was able to kind of switch full time uh, to taking those really cheap commissions and then ultimately going to the conventions, that's where all my capital came from. I just had a bunch of savings. Mm -hmm. I burned through it all when I first started, but the fact is I had it there. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's hard for me to to recommend doing it for people. Like, I, I I don't know. I can't in good conscience tell someone, yeah, just go full time right out of art school mm -hmm. because that could be disastrous. Yeah, you know, you have to have the capital behind it. So I just it fell in a good place i fell in you know from a good from a good place in life where i was able to go all in mm -hmm. fast yeah. were you scared like when you you basically quit your job so walk me through how you decided to quit because technically up until that point you that was your life i was like robot like like with the cons it was mm. just like that all over again oh my god i just realized that, right now. that <laughs> same over you gotta again. fall yeah. out of that yeah. trap, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I get so invested in something, and I think it's good, and I'm just like, I get so deep into it. Mm -hmm. So it was like that with the car, huh. with the cars, you know. And then I just, I just needed a moment of clarity, and then I got to think about it, and I was just like, wow, this isn't at all what I wanted to do. So it was a little different with the art thing, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after that that crazy night in Vegas, I was still like, well, I still want to draw, but I need more time to draw. Mm -hmm. With the car thing, I was like, I don't want to, I don't even change my own oil anymore. <laughs> all this yeah, shit. yeah, I'm like, yeah. so um the process was i just i i quit that job and then i uh was watching i was watching uh some artists um because i was a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh player mm -hmm. so there's some artists that i follow who i follow today they were drawing on play mats and i thought that was really interesting so i tried drawing a Yu-Gi-Oh character in my notebook and it didn't look very good but um I was like, whatever. So I uploaded the time lapse to it because I was just like, whatever. I thought it was fun. But I uploaded that to YouTube and then somebody from the Yu-Gi-Oh! community saw it and they commissioned me to do it, like a really small piece. It was like 20 bucks. And I was like, hey, cool, man. I'm going to take your 20 bucks. And I just, 
was on a bunch of Yu-Gi-Oh forums. I just kept sharing. I just kept doing that over and over and over. I make sure to record everything so that it doubled as like advertisement. Mm. And it was because of those advertisements was I able to get more commissions. So YouTube has always played a big part uh, in my art career. Mm. And then that just kept growing. And then eventually I went to that con where I saw that guy. Mm -hmm. And then I went to AX. And then you know the rest of the story. Mm. So that's how it transitioned over. So in in a way, it wasn't like super intentional. Like it almost... none, none of it was intentional. Yeah. Yeah. And when I thought it was, like, then we got stuck at home, and I was like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's like that's so crazy because that's exactly how I felt when I when I was at Disney. Um, I was depressed. I'm like I. That's the best way to describe yeah, it. Yeah. Right? I I was like, once you you have that like moment like for you was the the dead poet society scene for me it was conventioning because i felt so much joy from doing my own thing from like uh interacting with people having like like you said like twenty dollars not much but like it's something like you have this moment where you're like people someone is literally paying me twenty dollars yeah. for something i thought was worth nothing <laughs> yeah, you get more joy out of that yeah than like whatever it is they're paying you at this other place that you don't really care about yeah mm -hmm. yeah and um work for me even though it's like so similar like i think what people can't wrap their heads around is like you're still doing art though like you're, you're drawing cartoons it's the same thing but it's not like a, it's a corporate job <laughs> for lack of a better word like most of the time you're not even drawing like a lot of the times you're not even drawing um well explain how like you felt emotionally though i mean like because you know emotionally i felt like i'm stuck in this cubicle not doing what i love when i know like it's not that i love conventioning but I knew conventioning brought me more joy than this. And that's well, sad. It's not perfect, but I know it's better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that, like, most of my life is, is being spent here, being wasted here. And I was like, I could be doing something I actually enjoy even a little bit more. And when you have that realization, I, I had the same thing. I used to get up in the morning, like 5 or, or 6 a.m. or whenever it was before work to go work out. I couldn't do it anymore. Like, I, I couldn't wake up. I couldn't come, like, I come home, and I used, like I said, I used to um, make prints for conventions. It was even hard to do that because I, I didn't want to touch a pencil or a pen anymore. And, like, like I, I just couldn't. And, um... But it was scary for me because I, it was my life. Like, I, I, I thought this was my dream. I thought, I thought, like, what else am I supposed to do? Like, this is my identity in a lot of ways. Um, and also, I think it sucks because a lot of people around you will tell you, like, you're crazy because you work for Disney. Like, who would pass that up? And then I was like, but... They just don't get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, but I'm not happy. How did you uh, explain this to your, like, parents or friends, Chris? Like, like that, you, it seems as though you've been doing me mechanics for, like, forever, and then yeah. all of a sudden you, like, want to do work. Well, it, it's because at that point, I think a lot of them kind of just not... I don't want to say they gave up on me, oh. but I think I've tried so many things that if I came to them with something else, they'd be like, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not being funny. Like, for real, like... Mm. My parents, they're just like, you know, uh, I I went to UC Santa Cruz mm -hmm. and uh, among other things, and it always just didn't end well or I didn't finish it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if I come to them with a new idea, you know, I don't know why I would bring it up to them. Maybe I'm seeking approval or whatever. Mm -hmm. At that point, they were just like, sure, <laughs> sure, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, my friends too. Like that, that's what. So it wasn't. There was really no resistance on mm -hmm. my um, when I want to become an artist which another thing when people ask me for advice i also because you know a lot of times family mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can't be supportive especially older when they don't understand that mm -hmm. the different ways to make money now mm -hmm. you know there's no gatekeeping like there was even just 15 years ago mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want and make money i can't help people who don't have supportive families because while mine didn't put me down they also they didn't put me up or put me down they were just like 
<laughs> neutral. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. Did you guys have any family issues or no, like going to art school? Did they, oh. was there any pushback to that? No, I mean, like, know, Asian family, you know. I know. I mean, like, for me, like, I've always been, like, it's, I've been drawing since I was in third grade. So it's, like, it, it, it was no surprise when I wanted to, like, sell my life away to art school, to my family. Okay. But, like, uh, when, but when Janet, I remember when Janet told her parents that she wanted to quit Disney and do a business, she was, like, can't you just, they were, like, can't you just be happy? <laughs> can't you just, can't you just relax? Can't you, you, you're fine. Like, why yeah, do you have to do this? You're so well yeah. in life. <laughs> So, yeah, well, like, going to art school was, I think, more dramatic than quitting Disney for my family, actually. Because uh, I clearly had the aptitude to do other things. Um, mm. I, they, they wanted me to, like, typical Asian family stuff, like, stable. S find something stable. Find something normal. Not be an artist who starves, because they are, they didn't even know about animation really. They didn't think of that even as a, a job opportunity. Um, I fought them really really hard for years. Like when I told them, um, I think near the end of high school, they did everything they could to to sabotage me. Oh no! <laughs> and I I uh, would do things like. I led a lot of people on thinking that I would like go to like a, a good UC school or something like that because I, I could get in, but then I ended up not applying to any of them and then going like, I only apply to art schools, so take it or leave it. <laughs> um, and after that, I think I proved myself after, like I had a really hard time after I graduated because um, I didn't have stable work for like a year and a half so then they were like um once i did get hired though then i became like the golden child <laughs> oh okay. yeah well, oh one of those things yeah. of course yeah when as soon, as soon as janet made it to disney especially like your parents wouldn't stop telling all your extended family yeah, like <laughs> that's, stop that's one of those things though it's yeah. like if you do something and the end result is like less than what was desired then you're an idiot mm -hmm. but if it's the exact you could take the exact same road but if it so happens that you succeed then you're a genius yeah. mm -hmm. you know oh, yeah. I'm just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> stop like, I, had, I had family members that were like I always supported you and I'm like uh huh <laughs> the one that told me to like quit and go be a doctor <laughs> I'm like okay um but the, so like because I've been fighting my parents all the time and, and like at the end of the day I, I could be like I told you so like I, I had it in me to get hired at, at like the studios and stuff when I told them I want to leave to start basically my own business they were like not happy about it but they were like okay I guess like and that's our daughter yeah that's, <laughs> that's Janet oh so they were also like sure yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, basically yeah they're yeah, like in, in, a, in a weird way they're kind of like I'm not worried about you that much because <laughs> you, you clearly make things work well that, that's a that's one of the best compliments a parent could give though when they're just like I don't agree but I'm I know you'll be fine whatever yeah because <laughs> I mean then they trust you enough to make a decision. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good position. It means they see you as an adult. Yeah, finally. Oh, you've grown up. Fucking finally, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, too. Like, we both made weird life career changes when we were adults. So it's not like our, our parents or anyone around us could really control us or, or tell us what to do and <laughs> oh yeah. yeah yeah but we still run it by them for some reason yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, so now that now that you know things are starting to open back up and you know you have you have your your online you have the podcast you have the youtube channel mm -hmm. when conventions do ultimately open back up what's your plan like you said like we're treating it like almost like a meet and greet okay not like before it was more like oh we're we're here to make money this is the thing like this is the business but now it's more like no this is like like a brand awareness okay. thing well i meant more like how about volume wise how many are you planning to do are you just oh yeah like throughout like throughout the like say next year con circuit we're yeah like, let's say let's say 2022 i was thinking like especially we were talking about this yesterday actually yeah. we were thinking of doing this once a season one a season yeah like four because there's always a big one a season so like we were thinking if like 
things were great and if things were open, we would have something like WonderCon in the spring, mm -hmm. something like uh, Phoenix or something like that in the f in summer. Maybe Anime Expo if we could get in, but uh, Phoenix could be our summer thing. And then in the fall, uh, late summer, we could do LA Comic Con and uh, we have Designer Con. In for so winter, there's that. Yeah. yeah, for winter. So it, it's enough. I've I found that like it's perfectly spaced because like when we were doing like eight cons <laughs> a year, um, it was really difficult to keep up with making new stuff. Yeah. Um, it was maybe like a few months in between each convention. So in that month, how how many prints can you technically make when you're working full time and all that stuff? And now that we have YouTube and we have the podcast and we have all these things. Um, we can't possibly do that like I can barely yeah. make like one piece of art like a month um, so it gives us enough time to make art and then promote ourselves grow our YouTube channel would be at a certain size um, and it would I don't know be more strategic about <laughs> like when we show up it's more special than like you can see us every weekend yes that that's one of the reasons I'm cutting down on conventions well one I'm tired of them. But two, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you're available all the time, there's no, there's no like urgency to come see you. Yeah. You know, um, when I do go back to cons, it's not to sell in the artist alley. It's going to be all exhibitor, and I'm going to be doing live artwork because you know I'm very heavily inspired by Kim Jong Gi, and I love what he does. Mm. And I think that's something that, like you guys mentioned, live live drawing at the tables is already hard for some people. Imagine having a like a eight foot canvas like mural. Basically. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's gonna really put a gap between me and like you know the the uh, next person. So that's what I'm gonna be doing at cons. And mm. um, if I only do that at certain shows, I feel like like you guys said, it'll make it more valuable because I won't be at when's your next show before I would be like oh, I got one in like an hour. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, th this one th now the. You know, the new way will be, oh, it's in like two months on yeah. the other side of the country. Good luck. Yeah. Nice. Be there or yeah, you'll miss yeah. me. So yeah. I, I think that's good, too. You guys manage that. Um, I think that the whole back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back convention thing is only good if you're trying to make mad money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is there. It's still <laughs> It's there if you wanted to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would treat it... Like we, we always had this like fantasy that like we, we treat it like musicians do, where like they, ha they put out an album and yeah. then they like tour for yeah. like a year but then they have time to like like create create yeah <laughs> yeah their next album and then and then they tour again and i because i think after musicians always are like oh after a whole tour they're like so ready to like not <laughs> to like make music again and do what they're supposed to be doing yeah it, it's it's exactly that except you're touring non-stop yeah yeah i mean that's what I was doing. I don't recommend that. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick, I want to talk about. Um, we talked about this briefly. You were really into, you know, these like collage things, and it's almost like I think you were featured on Kotaku or something. Yeah. And then uh, that four times. <laughs> four times. Yeah. Four times. No, it's counting. Four no, times. It's <laughs> um, but uh, and then you suddenly pivoted to this this more like live drawing, no lay in, just from the gut, uh, Kim Jong Gi style no. stuff. So like. Like, what was your inspiration to, as to why to do that? And, like, how was the grind to get that quality of stuff to the, where you were happy the, um, with? You know, even though I was uh, very robotic during the convention years, and I, I was still thinking about stuff. And mm. there's this level of escalation going on at the conventions where it was, like, I have a small, like, 11 by 14 print. And then the next person's like, well, mine's 11 by 17. And someone's like, oh, yeah, well, mine's holographic. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, well, mine has glitter. Like, well, mine has gold. Someone's like, I have a metal fucking print. What do you want? <laughs> and there's a guy who has, like, I, I'm being serious. Like, I'm not joking. Like, this is all stuff I've seen. No, I remember. And there's, like, metal prints with holographic gold sparkles. Oh, I'm like, Jesus everything. Christ. And I was like, everything. <laughs> and I was just like, well, we can keep trying to one-up each other like this. Or... Um, I can just, you know, I can just be an artist mm. and go out there and draw. And I'm like, it's the simplest thing, but it's probably the thing that most of these convention artists are lacking. And I know that because I'm super deep into it and I know how little time we have to draw. So if I could focus more on just getting better at drawing 
and uh, present that and do it in a way that other people are either too nervous or don't have the capability to do, I feel like that'll set me apart. And that's where the idea came from. Uh, the problem is um, I was so stuck in the whole convention circle, it's hard for me to improve. So uh, when I was done rendering my vlogs for the day, I would just sit there and try and sketch as much as I could. Or if I was at the table at the convention, I would sketch people. I was doing this at Sabacon mm. even when um, I would uh, sketch people passing by because you know you only get them for a couple of seconds. So you try and get their gesture and you try and study like their clothing folds and stuff best you can. The best place is at the airport because mm -hmm. everyone at the airport is in like survival mode and they're all in <laughs> weird positions and you get some nice, nice poses uh, there. So I was trying to really make the most of my time. I even went to a... Um, a workshop with Kim Jong Gi, mm. well, not with him. He was there uh, in San Francisco in t late 2017, and I remember just watching him do his because I had watched so much of his stuff online. But to see him live is very different because you get to see the expressions on his face, and mm. you just I don't know, it's just something different. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking, and I was like, "This is learnable. Like this is not like some magic magic trick. Like, um, you know, when you look at it online, I was like, this is you could learn this. Like you can." So that that was a real you know kick too, and I was like, okay, this is what the focus is gonna be. We're not gonna do prints forever. We're gonna do something else, and that's where it came from. Yeah, man, yeah. It takes a lot of guts and stuff to draw in front of people. Like, I don't understand how musicians do it. Like to just draw, <laughs> like it's it's awesome what you do for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, streaming on Twitch now, which is what I do now, mm. ever since being locked away, um, has helped me a lot. I actually feel like it was probably. Um, the show's getting canceled was probably the best thing to happen to my art career mm -hmm. it slowed me the hell down it got me to uh, spend more time with like the people I care about mm -hmm. and it gave me more time to like uh, invest in long term things like I think Twitch and uh, learning uh, how to draw in front of people and interact uh, is long term and uh, of course I'm streaming all my art studies so I can, I'm basically monetizing my art studies which is really cool plus the cool thing is you don't have to be nervous about it because if you mess up nobody's going to give you a hard time because it's under the guise of a, an art study mm. they're like oh this doesn't look right the other people in the chat are like yeah this is a study we're trying to learn and I'll put, yeah yeah that's cool yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep going <laughs> nice yeah. I think like the true survivors are like the, the ones who like you were like we make this this uh, coof work. <laughs> like we can't go to conventions anymore. We gotta get creative. That's what we do, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of the same deal we had. We were super excited to like, uh, you know, vlog our con and to share how our earnings and all this stuff. But then, you know, the coof hit. But then we had to figure out. Okay, well, this is how it is now. We gotta figure out how to sell things online and have yeah. an online presence. Because one of the reasons why we went from like trying to to do what you do did um, to going like no only the biggest cons were because we realized very early, pre -co pre pre coof um, we nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we didn't want to rely on a con because we have too many horror stories about a con scamming us out of money and just, oh let's talk about tohokan yeah, uh, yeah. yeah yeah so for example <laughs> we were at tohokan um, which what year was this 2015 i'd say 15 15 either 15 mm. or 16 um Sounds like it. and it was an awful 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 con like very low attendance numbers um we somehow barely scraped by getting um making back the table which was like a hundred something dollars but i got like viciously ill during the middle of the con i don't know if anyone could tell but i was like puking like i puked in the car it yeah. never smelled the same after no, it didn't. um unfortunately the car went to my sister <laughs> and uh i i didn't want to leave vincent alone in the convention artist alley because they had given us free hotel rooms free. free and so i was like i i tried to sleep it off but then i i felt guilty that vincent was like selling so i came down and i at a certain point i was like 
deliriously drawing something to help make money for the table and i couldn't anymore like i felt like i was gonna pass out so i was like sleeping under the table while like while the con was going on and it was a hot mess and then like by the end of it we were like well at least we made back our table and then like a week later we get a notification we're like well we got charged on our credit cards without anyone letting us know the hotel room fee which was like 500 something dollars and i was like what is this and at the time um i was still living with my parents and my dad was furious he does not like getting scammed so uh and he for sure does not like his daughter getting scammed so he was like yelling (laughs) at hilton (laughs) at the time it was just like why would you scam a little girl i was like 21 at the time (laughs) why would you scam a little girl (laughs) no but i mean it it came the email came from the convention yeah and it was it i mean everything seemed like it checked out well up until it was already done with you know Mm -hmm. like what a bunch of Old. Yeah, no man, that's unreal. Well, yeah, I we, have that. I have that guy on my radar too. If I ever run it, if I ever run into him at a convention, <laughs> I'm gonna get my 500. Yeah. That, that's one thing I told my friend because I told him about that story, uh, and he knows how mad I was. And like, I'm not trying to like be like, oh, I'm gonna keep it real, but like, I'm gonna keep it real with that one instance. Like, if I run into him, um, what was his name? Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, yeah, I wrote his name down, but like if I run into him at a con, which I still hear he goes around to cons, I'm oh getting my, my 500 back. I'll get yours back if you want. <laughs> I mean, that would be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. can't believe he still shows his face. I would have gone into hiding if I were him. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, like people were out to we get were, me. That, that con was like the talk of the town. We were at <laughs> CTN, and then like all the industry people, did you know there was a con where like they scammed a ton of people? And then like the person next to him was like, oh, dude, I know. I was in it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm How? one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, what was it like? I was like, it, I don't know. It's, you get scammed. It's how was it for you? Yeah. Like, how? What no, was it? I, that's when I was still doing really bad at shows. Mm. Mm. You know what? I didn't start making money at conventions until I started doing those collage pieces. Mm. Like, you know, I had the Pokemon one, mm-hmm. which I, I had almost like just made that when we when we met. Mm-hmm. And I know we traded art, and mm-hmm. I gave you one of the old ones. But um, once I started realizing that that was what was bringing in the attention and the money then i made one for league of legends and then i made it so that the whole table was just emphasized on those Mm. but yeah so i i and like i said ultimately i worked towards just having five different prints all just collages Mm. so uh i I pretty much sucked at every con until i realized that Mm -hmm. because i feel like the the more like pinup style like single character stuff Mm -hmm. well i put like an anime girl or something on there that's interesting but like everyone has that so it could be good but it just doesn't stand out so it's hard to get attention Mm -hmm. so like it's not that that stuff isn't appealing the problem is it is appealing but there's just too much of it um which is why i always tell people to kind of veer away from that if you could i i think uh like my original uh artwork Mm -hmm. that i sell it's all grayscale and it's um Mm -hmm. in landscape and uh i compose it like uh almost like a storyboard like i I am into cinematography, so I make it look like a shot out of a movie. Mm -hmm. Um, So I tell people, uh, you don't have to do a bunch of fan art that everyone else, like the Sakimi-chan stuff. You know, everyone's glossy, everyone's covered Mm. in whatever. (laughs) (laughs) That's what's liquid. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think if you could just stand out at a con, that is really important. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I, there was, there, I intentionally kept that stuff grayscale, one, because it, my line art is really good compared to everything else I do because mm. my other stuff sucks. But my line art is really good. So I was like, grayscale, it like emphasizes my line art. I got stuff laser printed instead of ink printed, which made the lines like, they have like a bit of a groove on the paper. Like so, raised, so, yeah. yeah, so in the in the light, you could see it. So, and because I had that like backdrop style display where I used a drape, a black drape, and mm. then I, I, used, I used magnets to hold them up, mm-hmm. the prints, it was all black and gray and it stood out because everyone else like all their saturation bars were cranked up to like 200 <laughs> percent. so that was my strategy so until i figured that out i was doing terrible so mm. toho con i did awful yeah. <laughs> yeah. even before the 500 hotel charge yeah. it was really bad what what was the like when did you guys start like doing well at 
cons? Like, what, what was the first time you sat there and were just like, oh. I know you said there was one that, uh, you said Anime California lit the fire. Yeah. Was there one where you were like, all right, we got it. I think I know the one. It was uh, the sec, I think it was the one after Anime California where we did Sabacon because Janet was very, was she not, not really sure if she was going to do this, but like we, for the first time, took uh uh, what would you do? Uh, co- commission super seriously. Even like we were selling them for like twenty, twenty five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, like slow. nothing. It was money, nothing. money through volume, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. yeah, there were tons of kids who were just wanted their favorite anime character, and then just like the whole, you know, how, how it is. I'm sure you've had the experience where like you've get, given somebody a, a a commission and they're like bawling or like they're just like super <laughs> like, appreciative. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and then that was like the whole thing where like we were driving back from Vegas and then Janet was like. I think I really, really, really like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I think the emotional uh, connection with people is what I like, which is why I still really love doing commissions. Not I'm like I don't offer them anymore, partly because I'm so busy, but like I, that's what got me. Like, oh, this is why I got into art. I wanted to move people. I wanted to like make people feel something or or think about something. It wasn't just to like because I wanted to draw pretty pretty things um but yeah it was, it was sabacon we that af that was a uh, anime california was our first time selling commissions and it was like halfway into the con we literally made a sign like we hand wrote yeah. a sign that says commissions open and we didn't have any commission samples so i literally drew my very very first original ink drawing um, it was really bad because I, at that point, I hadn't done that in a while since school, and that really upset me. I was like, I've gotten so bad <laughs> since I graduated, and I was complaining a bit. And like, you need someone who want who like tells you the truth, <laughs> no, <laughs> no matter what. And Vincent told me like, well, you kind of suck at it, and you just need to do it a lot. And you need to give people examples of what you can do. So I think that whole week, uh, or maybe the month in between Anime California and Savicon, I was like angrily like (laughs) drawing in my sketchbook, like traditionally like ink drawings, and they were all so bad. You you remember how bad they were. And I was like, this is so hard. But like why is it why was this the one thing that like kind of made us money at anime california so eventually i got a few like originals that i liked like down and then i i kind of got warmed up where like i think i can draw on the fly now like i can i can draw in front of people and when we went to anime california whenever there was downtime we made these little sketch cards we bought index cards yeah. from the store from i think state uh, office yeah. depot <laughs> yeah. and we sold we drew on them we drew whatever character popped to our head or whatever mm-hmm. and we sold them for a dollar, a dollar. <laughs> and this we literally were like we don't even care if it sells um because what are you make like a dollar for each little sketch card you're not making much but we wanted the the like performance of people seeing us draw yeah. and we want we knew we didn't have much work at the time we didn't have time to to make like everyone else has these walls of prints and we didn't have that yet so we we're like we're gonna cover our shit with original art yeah mm-hmm. and we're gonna do it at the con because we didn't have time so that's what we did our whole entire table was filled with um, little sketch cards and surprisingly we made a lot of money off of those one dollar sketch yeah, cards yeah, especially off of a uh, office depot index cards yeah. like a ten thousand percent markup <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. um yeah that's well, that's people it. like that um they just again i think it's that thing where they're just so used to seeing the wall of prints that they don't even see it anymore mm-hmm. that's what i think like you know i've been to so many shows I could walk down an artist alley and not even realize I, I passed like 10, 15 feet towers of prints, you know? Like it just, mm-hmm. it's I'm so numb to it. And I feel like this is a simple thing of like drawing on a card. Mm-hmm. Like people appreciate that because they just don't see it. It doesn't matter how like 
explosive your your design or your, your table setup is now these days i think people are just again they're just numb to it so i wouldn't be surprised where if you guys go back to your shows and you're doing a lot of live art that's going to get a lot of attention yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and i mean i always tell people too that like it's not really about skill level when it comes down to like selling your art sometimes like there, there are fantastic artists who can't sell anything um for whatever reason and i always say like it's all about branding like for you once you knew like what people wanted from you and what you were kind of known for um when you double down on it by making like a lot more collage pieces it it just like skyrocketed sales versus like if you uh don't really have a really um cohesive and like thought out branding for yourself so so like your friend who makes like chibi art i i know a lot of people who sell chibi art and they're very profitable and like you can look down on it all you want but like they're making bank yeah Yeah. (laughs) and and they have that branding thing that they know what they're good at they know how to market it and they know there's an audience for it and like i i always say that like i feel like there are a lot of industry artists who would look down on the convention artists yep. because they're not I don't know they, they don't have the resume or whatever and I'd be like no like I hate that I see how that affects the convention artists the independent artists I would call them and I'd be like no you guys are like the most admirable people I think I have ever met because you guys hustle you guys don't need Disney on your, your resume to like sell shit you guys are like the true entrepreneurial spirit. A lot of you guys didn't even go to art school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't even go have like three hundred thousand dollars in debt to do what you do and make more money than a lot of people selling your art. And I'm like that. That you know, don't let anyone look down on you. Like, or don't let that affect you. At least you guys are like doing it. They're not. No, I could I could definitely get that feeling from some people where it's like, it's almost like there's a like elitists yeah. out there where yeah. it's like no this is what makes a real artist you know quote quote right yeah i don't know i uh i'm glad that well i'm glad that i don't i don't see too much of that anymore yeah. um i think it's because everyone who i interact with they've seen my videos and they know i didn't go to art school mm-hmm. so i think it it kind of gives a little hope to the people who feel like they're behind like people who started drawing a little bit later in mm-hmm. life yeah, a lot of those people are just so discouraged because they talk to, they'll talk to other people. I'm not gonna say industry artists, but like you know, more established people mm-hmm. who've been drawing since they were like five years old, and they're like, no, it's too late. And I'll come up and I'm like, no, 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 don't listen to this guy, <laughs> <laughs> idiot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. The, um. Yeah, but uh, these days Twitch has been going really well. I'm really, really happy about it. Um, like I said, getting locked down has been great. <laughs> I was losing my mind at first because to go from traveling three, four weekends out of every month to just being not not only being stuck at home, but ha- not having the option to leave kind of messed with my brain a little bit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but um, uh, I don't know if you guys had ever seen my uh, my Anime Expo 2019 episode where I did the big live live art, and I'm talking it was it was big. It was like oh, seven man. feet by. 10 feet or something like that at, uh, upstairs at the AX exhibitor, exhibitor hall. I think I remember it, yeah. Um, but again, that's what I want to do. Twitch is helping me develop the skills for that. I purposely took a pay cut from doing... Because Artist Alley is where all the money is in, at Anime Expo. Mm-hmm. That's where all the money is. Yeah. So I, I purposely took a pay cut and left there to go upstairs. My, my income was like half of what it was the, mm-hmm. the previous years. Um, but again, I think for me that's that's what my goal is to just be able to go somewhere and you know what you were talking earlier about traveling and figuring mm-hmm. out how to lug all your gear yeah. it's as terrible as you think it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so the idea of going somewhere and just having somewhere to draw and not have to carry a bunch of shit is yeah, really awesome. yeah. 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 cool yeah, man you asked us what what was on the horizons for us what what's yeah. what are you up to hopefully mm-hmm. like the rest of this year and on to the next year like what's what's up um the the ongoing thing is continue to train to go out 
so that I'm ready to to do live art. Mm. Um, but you know, I have Twitch. We have the uh, the Sad House art book, which is me and eight other artists. Um, so a total of nine ink artists. Uh, I think we come from seven different countries, mm. and none of us have really large followings. So we took our our small followings, came together, and made a made a book. Nice. And then my solo book will come out later this year, um, but I can't I can't do them at the same time. Mm. But the the solo book will be all the sketches that we've done on Twitch over the past year and a half. So there's weeks and weeks of uh, animal studies. There's perspective demos. There's a ton of gesture work. Uh, we've done over three thousand pages of, oh, of uh, art studies over the past year and a half. Um, I work out of these really big six hundred page sketchbooks because they dude. look really impressive. <laughs> but people think people think I get it because it's like really fancy. I get it because uh, per page it's the cheapest way. <laughs> oh my god! Plus, like, there's no spiral, so it's it's nice to stack them up. Like anyway, mm. yeah. Um, so I have that sketchbook that I have planned to come out later this year. Um, I have some conventions that I can't get out of this year. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, one in, I think the biggest one I have this year is Utah. Uh, it's a um, Salt Lake Comic Con. I'll be doing live art there, so I have to go drive. I have to go drive there. It's like a twelve-hour drive because uh-huh. um, I have pro panels now. Because I'm so. Do you know oh, pro panels? Man, what is uh, that? Yeah, the what? pro panels. Those big black. Yeah. Uh, little, they can come in any color, but like they. Um, they're like, they're like um, professional displays. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're the tall ones. Yeah. Huh. Uh, I got those, so I have to drive that because I can't fly those over. I'm going to drive those over to Utah and mm. do live art there. And uh, I think I, if Anime NYC does happen this year, uh, I'm going to go to it. Mm. I hope it doesn't because I don't want to go out there <laughs> and fly it <laughs> with all my stuff. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, that's it. I'm just gonna just gonna keep on growing the Twitch. Um, I actually picked up a sponsorship with Deviant Art nice. through Twitch. Yeah. It's it's a sponsorship program specifically for Twitch artists. Mm. Um, it's cool among all the different people they could pick from. The first set of people, there was only eight mm. that they chose, eight artists, and it was weird because it was weird because uh, the other seven people were like they're like partnered. They had all these followers, <laughs> you know, list off all this stuff, and it's just like me, and I was the only traditional. Uh, artists oh. for the first wave and I was like I think I'm like the token black guy here oh. <laughs> but I'm like but that's cool because then they can't get rid of me so yeah. Like, that's cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah man well where can people find you on Twitch like you oh yeah I'm on uh, twitch.tv uh, slash c-c-a-y-c-o-a-r-t so C-C-A-Y-C-O-A-R-T. awesome Art, yeah. everyone follow him on Twitch <laughs> um, and yeah we always close with a recommendation Chris Kakayo do you have a recommendation for our audience um, anything really I haven't I haven't really been keeping up with too much new stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. I did watch Invincible. Finally. Fantastic, Fantastic. right? Fantastic. I saw Fantastic. the first episode of Loki. Oh, okay. Nice. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, I finished reading Attack on Titan. Mm-hmm. If you haven't started Attack on Titan, just don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. Not worth it. Ah, <laughs> uh, dude. Well, we re- really appreciate you coming and taking the time yeah. for sure. No, this is great. Yeah. I appreciate you guys. This was really me. fun. Yeah. 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 I love how this sure, turned out. Make sure to like, subscribe. I don't know where it is sitting on this side. This way, maybe. Jingle all our bells and buttons. And uh, head over to honeyapps.com to buy all our merch. And check out these videos over here to binge all our episodes. And we'll see you next time. Bye. See you guys.